My name is Max Gagliardi, and this is the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. You can leave a review that would help me out. This episode's sponsored by Blockware Solutions. If you're interested in mining Bitcoin, Blockware has a ton of research out there, some great content creators, an awesome podcast. You can check out their website. Uh, they've got all the tools you need to understand how Bitcoin mining works and what's going on in the marketplace. They've also sold over 250,000 ASIC computers to clients. They've done over 200 megawatts of hosting for their clients, uh, and they've mined over a thousand Bitcoin in the Blockware pool. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit blockwaresolutions.com slash energy, and that would help out the channel. That's blockwaresolutions.com slash energy. This episode's guest is Mike Alfred. Mike is on the board of Eagle Brook Advisors, as well as Iris Energy. He's got multiple decades investing in the capital markets, as well as experience as an entrepreneur who's founded multiple startups. Mike was also early in calling out the warning signs for the Celsius network and the Lunaterra collapse. He's been an active person on Twitter who's calling out people and telling them to be careful investing in these DeFi and crypto projects. This episode, we talk about the current state of the capital markets and how Mike is investing in this environment. We chat about his history as an entrepreneur and the different startups that he's founded. Then the discussion moves to Bitcoin mining in the public markets and Mike's take on the different opportunities and risks with the publicly traded Bitcoin miners. And lastly, we talk about the corruption in the DeFi and the crypto space and how when things seem too good to be true, they often are. Hope you enjoy the show. Mike, welcome to Talk Energy. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Max. Uh, it's good to do this on a holiday. Yeah, thanks for making it on Memorial Day. We've got uh, important things at the poolside to get to here in a minute, so we'll uh, we'll get through it. But you know, this is an energy podcast. I do a ton of Bitcoin content. It's energy back to money. Uh, you're someone I follow on Twitter. I don't know your story, your full story. I thought you'd be a great guest and got some topics to dive into. But maybe just start out with your background and got a lot of listeners from the traditional energy space. Sure. Well, I mean, I grew up in uh, Southern California. Uh, you know, I was a pretty good student athlete. I uh, grew up surfing, playing soccer, et cetera. Went to uh, Stanford undergrad, uh, started trading stocks uh, right before I went to Stanford and, and well through most of my time there. So I was a history major, but you know, you wouldn't have known it because I was reading about stocks like the whole time I was there and kind of lived through the, the dot-com bubble, uh, invested all the way through that. And, you know, I've still been going today. It's been 23 years or so since I've been investing my own money. Um, and so learned a lot through that process, but separately from that started a couple of different software companies. Uh, one of them was called Brightscope. Uh, that was a 401k rating, uh, platform. We gathered data from the government and sold it to large asset managers, uh, built that company up to about 70 employees, sold that in 2016, uh, got into crypto data in, in 2017, 2018. And so tried to build a Bloomberg for crypto. Didn't get as far as I would have liked, but managed to sell it to NYDIG in uh, 2020. Uh, briefly ran strategy and M&A at NYDIG. In, in that uh, role, I talked to maybe 50 industrial scale miners, uh, Bitcoin miners, and learned quite a bit about that space, particularly how those companies get funded uh, over time. And, and so when I left NYDIG in, in uh, June of last year to focus entirely on my own investing, I ended up joining the board of Iris Energy, uh, which is one of the larger industrial scale uh, miner. And it actually, they went public in October of uh, October, November of, of last year. And so I've been enjoying working with those guys. Um, separately from that, I'm an investor in about 50 other companies. That's awesome. I want to get into the Bitcoin and capital side here in a minute, but just taking a step back to the investing in equities and uh, just kind of these, the market right now, it just seems like a weird, weird time. You've been through different market cycles. I've seen you tweeting lately about uh, different stock strategies, equity strategies. You've mentioned them, some things about energy stocks. Just kind of your, we'll start high level, just your takes on where we're at uh, in this market, in equities. And then I think that'll segue nice into the Bitcoin and in the capital side for mining. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a nuanced discussion, right? A lot of what I see on CNBC and, and just on Twitter is kind of, uh, kind of lower level conversation, right? It's like, look at the index, it's either expensive or it's not expensive. But the reality is if you go deeper underneath the surface and you look at what's actually happened over the last five or 10 years, uh, what you've seen is this excessive, obscene valuation in a certain subsectors of the economy, particularly technology, anything sort of innovation related, like Kathy Wood's sort of the poster child for this style of investing, where you basically buy anything that's new and sexy and looks like it's going to grow really fast and you're essentially willing to pay any price for that. And so what you've seen is this disconnect in valuations between things that are rooted in the real world, 
like energy and things that are rooted in this sort of metaverse, this fictional metaverse that, um, you know, where we're all going to live and we're going to wear headsets and we're not going to need to eat or drink or need energy anymore because we're going to be floating in this magical uh, void. And so, you know, you saw that with energy stocks, right? Energy started to get hit. You remember this in 2014, they turned down pretty dramatically and they basically were hated uh, for the last seven or eight years. Um, you know, energy as a percentage of the S and P, I think bottomed out at like 3%, which is absolutely insane when you consider how important energy is to the, to the broad functioning of the economy in the long run, but, but yet how small a percentage of the S and P it actually was. And then you had like a handful of stocks like Netflix, uh, you know, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon that were essentially driving the index over that period. And so what you saw about 12, 18 months ago was just people on Twitter saying stuff like value is dead right? Energy is dead. Uh, consumer staples and healthcare are dead. Uh, the only thing that matters is, is Netflix, Facebook, Shopify, Carvana, et cetera. Um, and of course, right at that moment of maximum optimism, you know, the market reversed and, and many of those stocks are now down 60, 70, 80% off the highs. And, and of course, the XLE, which is a, a broad basket of energy stocks led by, you know, Exxon Mobil and Chevron is up something like 55%. Last year, it led in 2021, but it's already up more in 2022 than it was in the entire year of 2021. And so you're seeing this reversion to the mean where people are recognizing that um, just because a company has a real world present does not mean it has no value. In fact, quite the opposite. Right. I think COVID and the supply chain issues have, have brought that front and center and reminded people that, you know, you can't just live in the metaverse. You still need to eat. You still need to drink. You still need to drive. You still need energy. And so... Uh, the market is now pricing back in these sort of real world necessities that people actually actually need. So I have no idea what the S&P does next or what the NASDAQ does. Next. That's not really what I do. What I actually focus on is what uh, segments and what particular companies are undervalued at any, any specific period of time. So if you followed me closely on Twitter at the end of 2020, I was lambasting pretty much the entire uh, portfolio of Kathy Wood and saying, look, you should not be buying these stocks at 100 or 150 times. Uh, sales. You should not be buying Netflix and Shopify and Carvana at those levels. You should be buying CVS, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, energy stocks like Enterprise Partners, et cetera. Um, and that was wildly unpopular, right? Those tweets got four likes, six likes. Of course, the, that was the right call uh, at that time. Where we are now, I think a lot of those stocks are closer to fair value, right? Like healthcare stocks have come up quite a bit. Staples are, are actually probably overvalued at this point. If you look at companies like Pepsi and Procter and Gamble, I own them owned them for a long time. I'm not recommending them here because they're trading at 25 uh, times earnings. And and while I think Netflix and Shopify are cheaper, I still don't think they're necessarily cheap. Uh, so wh- where are we sort of broadly on the macro? I think we could see you know another 15, 20% uh, worst case sort of on the downside in equity markets. But I think long run, you want to own equities and you probably want to own them at, at these prices because if you're looking out three, five, seven years, as long as you're not uh, piling into the most overvalued segments of the economy, you're going to do just fine. Yeah. Well, I lived through the 2014 when we started our company that we have now. It was in 2014. And I joke around. I've said it on the podcast. It was like oil was 85 bucks and I didn't have any kids. I was married, had no kids. And then about six months later, after starting the company, oil was at like 30 bucks and uh, Mm -hmm. had a kid on the way. It was a highly stressful uh, time in my life. And it's been an interesting thing to watch. You know, it was interesting to me was just the amount of private money that came in kind of that time frame. You know, we really we lucked out and our company focused on a lot of small to mid-sized groups. And, you know, we help uh, people monetize their energy, have an energy marketing business. And there was just a big wave of private equity capital in the space. And that really propped things up uh, for a while. And then we saw like in 2016, got challenging again. And then from 16 to 20, it was just, you know, really like COVID was definitely the down, uh, the, the most down I've been in my career, just around energy, you know, oil went negative. It just seems surreal. And then where we are today uh, with natural gas prices and oil prices where they're at, it's just been a remarkable last year uh, to watch this. It still seems kind of fake, but it seemed counterintuitive looking at like a Tesla and seeing them at one point being worth more than every oil company in the world uh, in terms of equity valuations. I think there was that stat or at least all the majors. I don't know if it was everyone that's listed, but there were some ridiculous, you know, stats that were out there. It seems like we're finally coming back down to earth around what is real and what isn't. Um, and so it's been, it's been good for what I do, but I've also been focused on the Bitcoin side as well. And I kind of view this as almost like this incredible barbell investment where you've got on one hand, oil and gas producers can be uh, providing these blue blood commodities 
and uh, powering the world. And then on the other hand, they have the opportunity because they have such access to cheap energy, uh, even though energy has gotten more expensive, uh, that they can build out this future monetary network. So it's really fascinating space to play in. And I'm going to jump into that. But before, I didn't realize the startups that you had done. And I just want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and uh, just kind of that drive for you. When did you make that leap? When did you know that you wanted to get into that space, building a company? You said 70 employees. That's a lot of employees, man. I've got a lot less than that. And the headaches around dealing with that are tough. But just your thoughts generally on entrepreneurship and what led you on that journey uh, and hear about your story there. Yeah. So I can I can definitely address that. Can I go back real quick, though, sure. to the oil and gas uh, area? Because the 2019 period just strikes me as one of those once in a lifetime inflection points. I had been watching energy, you know, I own Chenier. I got very lucky because I own one of the only uh, energy stocks that actually did well uh, after the 2014 bust. And Chenier is the one that, that liquefies the natural gas and then puts them on barges and takes advantage of the differentials and natural gas prices between North America and, and other spots around the world where gas is typically more expensive. Um, but I was watching the U.S. pure play natural gas producer. So EQT, Right, which is the product of a bunch of different mergers. The Rice uh, brothers are running that. Uh, Antero, uh, Range Resources. Antero, I lived in Colorado in 2017, and Antero's office I could see from my my deck uh, where yeah. I lived in downtown uh, Colorado. So I walked by them every day as I was heading to lunch or heading to a meeting. Um, and so I was watching that space really closely. I actually owned a pretty large chunk of those three stocks at various points in 2019, and you can guess what happened like a lot of institutional investors just got blown up on the way down. They just would not stop going down. It was relentless, right? The pressure that yeah. was just like, it felt like your head was being squeezed. Every time they'd go down further, you'd, st you'd look at the balance sheet. You'd ask yourself, are people going to stop using natural gas? And you'd say no. And then the stocks would go down another 50%. And so I right. finally capitulated. I, I haven't made many mistakes at quite this magnitude, but I figure it's worth sharing. I finally capitulated sure. in like Q3, Q4 of 19 on all three of those names. And you know what happened next, right? They, they finally bought them right around COVID in like March of 2020, April, 2020. And Antero, for example, bottomed around like 68 cents, 70 cents. It's trading at 44 bucks now. So all I had to do was just hold my nose, but I just started to think like, maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe these, maybe these stocks are going to yeah. go to go to zero. And I saw a lot of institutional investors capitulate too. I mean, Imagine reporting your performance every month, every quarter on these energy stocks for, for year after year after year as they go from 60 to 50 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10 to 5 to 2. And uh, look, I'm not proud of that, but uh, very few people were able to hold those stocks uh, all the way down. So it just it just speaks to how hard investing is, investor psychology. I mean, that was the right area to be fishing in as a sort of deep value contrarian investor, and I still couldn't hold the positions, but luckily, you know, people who did hold them, they've done quite well, obviously over the last two years, um, as it relates to, uh, entrepreneurship, yeah. you know, I, I think one of the things you have to ask yourself is like, can you work for somebody else? And, you know, I can work for somebody else for between call it six and maybe 15 months it, it is my <laughs> historical, uh, press. And every time I've sold a company, I've tried to work for the acquirer and it just really doesn't work, um, because I don't like to play in somebody else's sandbox or in their kingdom. Right. And so, I think first and foremost, it's just like know who you are, right? I knew that I needed to build my own companies and I needed to kind of create my own uh, future and I just don't do well on somebody else's system. And so, you know, it's fun, you know, raising money and hiring people. But the reality is like if, if you've been doing it for 10 years, like I did across two different companies, at some point you realize it's a lot more fun to invest in a lot of different companies. And so now I actually sit on a bunch of boards and I help other entrepreneurs, you know, build their, their companies. And I, I get, get to participate in the conversations about strategy and fundraising, et cetera, that I'm interested in, you know, senior hires, but I don't have to take the calls on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis from the head of HR, uh, you know, because you have litigation or uh, the, the head of sales, because you have a major customer that's waffling and you got to get on an airplane and fly to Cleveland to try to save that deal. And so, um, you know, I, I feel like I sort of graduated from wanting to be CEO to wanting to just be on the board and um, using the, all the uh, learnings from being the CEO across a decade can now help uh, create leverage for those executives uh, going forward. But, but I, I did enjoy that period of my life. I just, I hit 39. I said, you know, I, I want to focus more on other things. I feel that sentiment <clears throat> a lot. I mean, it's, you know, one of those things where some of the most liberating feelings I've had is when you can 
hire people and you know that they're really good, they're probably smarter than you. If you hired somebody that's the right person and they're great at what they do and you've been able to have the vision to build the mousetrap, but then you can see it kind of flourish under, under other people. So that's one thing that I've really enjoyed is the, the ability to have employees to help you. And then I've also tried to, you know, do different businesses and diversify and create businesses across different segments. And that's been something that's kept me pretty passionate too, was being able to like, you know, okay, now we've got this real estate thing going, or now we're doing Bitcoin mining, or now we've got like a media thing that I'm working on. So it's like just different things, I think has kept it fresh for me, but it's still, you have to be able to, in my opinion, like I love that level that you're at where you can be on boards and see these things and participate in like the fun stuff. It's like being a grandparent or something, right? Like they get to see my kids uh, for like that short period and give their advice and then like, good luck, go change the diapers or whatever. And uh, they hand them back off to you. Uh, but it's been, it's for me, getting to a little bit of higher level, letting things go and just trusting in the people that you have in the organizations and then having really good partners is another thing. It's like, I've never been enamored with being the CEO. In fact, I, it's a relief to me to have kind of peers or partners in ventures because you, everything's on your shoulders and you have somebody that you can rely on and leverage. Um, so that's been a journey for me. It's just, it's stressful. The startup thing is a lot of stress. Um, so I don't know, I always just, I have a fascination with people that have done it and that have built businesses because I know how hard it is. And not just, even if you have a good idea and a good business, it's still stressful and it's difficult. Uh, so props to being able to, uh, to get through that. And you talked about capital raising and you said that, you know, you know, having an idea then raising the capital. One thing I wanna focus on is we pivot from oil and gas uh, because we've talked about some of the history that are the recent history on the equity side, but Bitcoin mining specifically, we started getting in this space about 18 months ago my background is we, we primarily the main company that we have is we buy and sell natural gas, start having Bitcoin miners approach us asking about stranded or disadvantaged gas and brokered a few deals. And then ultimately that led into us uh, starting a company where we're now, I have some of our own minds. We're also doing consulting and advisory and then kind of turn key solutions for it. And the biggest issue that I've seen in this space is that uh, for me, it's just the, there's just the lack of availability of capital. You've kind of got uh, this really high cost of debt that I just, you know, we're seeing now that the problems that that can cause people that are in that situation. And then you've got uh, kind of public companies and those valuations were sky high. Now they've come down, but uh, I'll lead you with at least that much and then get your thoughts in general around capital in the Bitcoin mining space. Yeah. So it's been, uh, it's been a tough year, uh, right. For, for uh, Bitcoin miners, particularly the publicly traded ones. So I will say that there are a bunch of privately traded miners that have a reckoning or come up and still ahead of them because they have not had to adjust their expectation or their valuation uh, alongside, you know, market conditions. Um, and that's the benefit of staying private, right? And, you know, Iris went public in November and in November, and I think Rhodium was supposed to go public right after us and they were sort of lucky they didn't, they didn't do that. Uh, and so they were able to stay private uh, longer, but uh, you know, conditions have gotten harder in some ways, but um, at the same time, the availability of capital has actually gotten broader, right? So you've seen a whole new group of investors, including some completely non-traditional investors, like large uh, individuals, multi-billionaire type of uh, family offices coming in. And so uh, on one hand, you know, like the broader macro environment is quite bearish. Anything innovation related, anything without profits right now, has gotten absolutely clobbered. On the other hand, the interest level from different capital sources uh, in this space have gone up qu quite dramatically. And I'm sure you saw the news about ConocoPhillips, uh, you know, doing some Bitcoin mining. I, I expect that to be uh, the the rule going forward. I expect all large integrated energy producers to get into Bitcoin mining. It actually makes no sense not to do it, at least somewhere in your operation, especially if you're ge geographically dispersed and you have a lot of different energy sources, uh, you just run the numbers and you say, man, it makes sense to actually uh, mine Bitcoin uh, in this area, right? Or with this power source. And so I, I expect a lot more large uh, energy producers to be coming into mining. And, you know, one of the thoughts I had was like, shouldn't a Chevron or Exxon Mobil be going ahead and buying somebody like a Marathon, uh, you know, which is an asset light uh, business, you know, Marathon has done really well in capital markets. They always seem to be raising money at the right prices. They seem to be able to access uh, capital markets in, in, in large size, where they haven't been quite as good as in running their operations. Right? They've had a lot of issues in their hard in Montana 
uh, facility. They've had a lot of issues actually keeping their machines plugged in. And so you can see this beautiful marriage where somebody who already has a large geographically distributed uh, organization but does not have a Bitcoin mining footprint could pick up all the IP, right, all of the machines, uh, all of the know-how uh, and go ahead and, and kind of build their uh, mining business, their Bitcoin mining business on that footprint. So I think that's going to be a really common uh, thing you hear about over the next few years. On the on the debt side, I mean, there's like a cornucopia of debt options all of a sudden available. You see a lot of machine financings, right, happening. Those uh, transactions are getting cheaper and cheaper. They used to be 18, 20, 22, 25% type coupons. Now you're seeing, you know, low teens uh, and, and in not all cases with warrant coverage. Um, you're, those are great for the miners because you're able to, to kind of uh, cleave those off from the main operating business. And so the liability sits in one place and doesn't affect uh, the rest of the business. Um, and you know, are also seeing uh, even cheaper financing against Bitcoin held on the balance sheet. And so you saw last year a bunch of the large miners come out and say, hey, we're, we're not going to sell our Bitcoin every day. We're going to put it on the balance sheet. That gives you a, 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 you know an asset that you can then uh, borrow against going forward. Um, and then you're just seeing uh, traditional lenders, hedge funds, et cetera, coming in with some high yield options. You know, the high yield market sort of took a dump uh, this year, but it, it started to bottom about a week and a half ago. Um, looks to be firming up. And so I expect a lot more debt options to be available as this year goes <clears> on. So I, I think actually now is potentially a, a very significant time. Uh, you know, when we look back two, three, four, five years from now, and you look at the stock charts of Marathon Hut. Core Scientific, Iris, Riot, et cetera, um, Argo. And, and you look back at the prices they're trading at now, I'm pretty sure in two, three, four, five years, um, we're going to say, man, can you believe you could have bought those stocks at those prices, right? Because the sentiment is so negative. But actually, the fundamentals of Bitcoin mining have, have never been better in, in some ways. And so um, I'm quite bullish on, on the space. Um, and I'm b bullish on the equity of the largest uh, miners. And I'm just bullish on the, on the space broadly. I like that. I like those comments. I mean, I think that for me, the biggest difference, maybe it's because I'm comparing it to like traditional oil and gas infrastructure. And so in 2018, we went out and raised like a $200 million equity commitment to go build uh, traditional midstream assets. So pipelines, processing facilities, things like that. At the time, you saw this big wave <clears throat> kind of from 14 up until around uh, 18, 19. It really started to slow down to a trickle. And then in 2020, obviously, there was hardly any private equity money uh, getting funded into oil and gas deals. And you know, you had guys that understood the space, so were fairly sophisticated around it. They understood the life cycle of where we're at, and there was just this larger pool of capital available. And you, and as a management team, you could get very favorable, you know, terms. You could get in, and maybe you only have to post a couple percentage points of the total equity uh, from the management commitment. You could get like a really nice waterfall uh, if you were to hit certain hurdles, and then you got, you know coverage for general administrative expenses so you could get salaries and things like that while you built the business. And so it really facilitated a ton of infrastructure growth uh, in oil and gas. And you saw a ton of midstream get built out from kind of 2010 to 2020. You saw a lot of downstream projects. I mean, you really saw kind of the shale revolution take hold and end of the 2000s and then through the last decade, uh, just this influx of infrastructure investment. And, you know, right now in Bitcoin, I just don't feel like there's that you know, there's not like five different private equity groups that have raised $2 billion each to focus on like mining, right? To where you can just go interview with those guys and they can pick out the most sophisticated teams. It does seem like it's more debt focused, uh, which we've been reluctant to do. We also have been reluctant to do pri or public company, uh, anything where it's like, hey, you know, there's a lot of guys pitching things like, let's get a SPAC together. Let's go, you know, uh, get something where we can take it public. So we've stayed away from that. And our philosophy has been stay equity funded if you can, um, try to get the cheapest, lowest cost energy, and then try to get multiple revenue streams to where you can offset. Like if you could buy reserves and you have some oil you can sell or some gas and you can offset your OPEX for the mining for that uh, to just try to get down to this really low mining cost. But do you think that this will change in the next few years where there'll be more kind of private equity where you can just go and if it's a good team with a track record who's executed, they can get meaningful capital because I just don't feel and maybe it's because I'm talking to the people in the oil and gas space, but 
all those guys seem really fascinating. Like we know all the big private equity groups, but none of them, they just want to learn right now. It doesn't seem like any of them are really making the plunge, but just do you, could you see private equity getting more sophisticated around this and becoming a large pool of capital to draw from uh, for guys wanting to do startups? Yeah. I mean, look, there, there are already call it more crypto native or Bitcoin native uh, teams that are working on uh, investing in, in miners, right? There aren't that many of them. Like the biggest deal I saw last year was a, was like a $50 million. Actually it was 150 million total uh, in equity first. And then the second later round, they did three to 500 million. And then they did another billion on top of that. Right. So this is not a, a transaction that's been widely covered or, or talked about, but I uh, did the first tranche of it. So I got to meet that team and learn about what they were doing. And the investors in that are quite sophisticated, um, but none of them, none of the three biggest ones that I can think of had ever done a Bitcoin mining transaction before. So it came together around the unique attributes of that deal, the size and scale of it. And so, yeah, there, there probably needs to be more like specialized capital focused on the space. Um, but that's going to happen organically. Like if you think back to like 2000, 2001, 2002, as people were really starting to understand the internet, there were very few people who understood like what Aquinix uh, was doing. And the same thing with like, if you think about the cell phone reads, like, uh, like American Tower and Crown Castle, right? The, you look back in time, those American Tower traded at two bucks back in 2001 or whatever it was, right? Um, Aquinix traded at like three bucks coming out of the, the dot-com you know, bubble and blow up. And those stocks are up hundreds of times um, since then. And of course, there's way more capital interested in doing those business models now because everybody understands the fundamental economics of data centers. Everybody understands the fundamental economics of cell phone towers. And I believe in five or seven years from now, everyone will understand maybe 10 years. It, we'll see how long it takes. It depends on how long, if there's a recession, it depends on right? Uh, how much the Fed pulls back on, on uh, liquidity. It depends on a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, at some point between five and 10 years from now, people will understand the, the fundamentals of the Bitcoin mining business in the same way that they understand those other business models. And at that time, magically, uh, there'll be plenty of institutional capital, including private equity and including additional debt, lower cost debt, debt options. So some of it's just time. And you know there are very few people on the planet right now who fully understand how Bitcoin mining makes the grid more resilient, right? So like a good example of that, like with Iris Energy, for example, um, you know, up in British Columbia, British Columbia is a, a highly regulated market where all the utilities have to earn a regulated return. And so when large scale industry like the paper and pulp industries pull out of those markets, it actually raises the price of energy for everybody else, including moms and pops uh, in that market. And so Bitcoin miners coming in there soaks up any excess power that was left behind when those large scale industries pull out. It actually keeps the price of, of energy low for all the other users. So that's one model, right? Another model is in like the panhandle of Texas, where as you know, there's 20 gigawatts of, of excess wind and solar and other renewables. Um, and there's no transmission lines to take that power down to the load centers. Um, you have a you have a deregulated market, and so there is no sort of regulated entity that requires a return. But what you do have is excess power that mostly trades at a really low price. Um, and so, in order to incentivize additional, um, you know, uh, build out of of renewables across the country, it's helpful to have this sort of customer there um, who can soak up a lot of that power on a day to day basis, but also uh, can operate on an intermittent basis um, because mining is so probabilistic. And because there's, you don't have to go from step one, two, three, four, five, six, where if you turn off your um, you know, operation at any point, uh, you lose all the work you did before. You don't have that in mining. It's not aluminum smelting. It's not any of these other industries where you can lose quite a bit of money if you have to turn off your operation. Bitcoin miners can go on and off uh, at any point uh, with very little impact uh, on the profitability of that enterprise. And so that actually having a lot of Bitcoin miners in the panhandle is actually going to make Texas's energy grid more sustainable and, and more resilient. And so those are just two <laughs> models that I've seen that work really well. But I think if more energy executives, if more investors understood that more deeply, they would realize what a huge opportunity it is to buy these kind of nascent uh, large scale Bitcoin mining operations at these prices where in some cases they're actually trading below the net asset value. They're trading below the right. value of just the machines 
in the land. You know, Irish is a good example because we actually own, in a lot of cases, the underlying land, all of the buildings, all the data centers. It's a fully vertically integrated operation with the exception of the, the power itself, uh, which of course comes from the grid. But in, in each case uh, in North America where Iris is operating, that grid power is is, a, is near 100% renewable. It's 98% renewable hydro power um, uh, up in Canada, and it's mostly wind and solar uh, in the panhandle where we're building out you know a couple of large facilities now. Um, so I, I just think that story as more energy executives, as more investors understand it, um, the, you know, the more capital will come in. And so five, six, seven, eight years from now, yes, there'll be plenty of capital available for anybody who wants to be in this business. Right. Love that. Um, thoughts around just kind of as this gets built out, as the, you know, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network gets built, you've got uh, all these different guys bringing on hash rate. And what about like a comparison to, you know, I, sometimes I worry, one thing that keeps me up a little bit at night is seeing what happened in shale. And I know you've got a strong background in looking at those companies. I can just tell from the commentary earlier in the episode. And the thing that happened was that when the capital markets did figure out that this is a new and kind of revolutionary technology that's going to change the landscape of energy, and it has. I mean, the U.S. is now the world superpower in energy. Part of the reason why I'm so bullish on the U.S. in general is because we have that going for us in North America broadly with Canada's energy and then, you know, Mexico, if it could pick it up on the manufacturing side. There's some things here. I think North America is really well positioned, even if the, you know, the world goes through recession. And what happened with all this capital coming in is that you had people kind of a land rush and guys were drilling to, they were going out and getting facilities similar to like if, you know, you have a land rush guys going out and getting PPAs, like power purchase agreements, going out committing to buying ASICs. Uh, there's all these different factors that are beyond just kind of cash flow that were driving uh, a lot of the supply that was coming online. And so what freaks me out a little bit in the Bitcoin space is if the capital does rush in and get sophisticated, could it uh, have something like what, what happened with shale and natural gas where you go through a prolonged period of just really, really a lot of pain just because guys were producing because they had to service debt, guys were producing because uh, they had to keep the lights on even though you know they were butting up against their marginal cost of production. I mean, these north uh, northeastern Appalachian shale producers, you know, producing at two dollars or two fifty natural gas when differentials and fees. I mean, they were basically making no money and they were depleting those reserves. And could you see that in like the Bitcoin space where a bunch of capital rushes in? You've got hash rate increasing, kind of agnostic to price, and that pushes it to just an extremely skinny or like a prolonged period of not necessarily Bitcoin price, but hash price. Uh, and, and, and or is it might be too bull, uh, too bearish on Bitcoin's price? Well, no. So, so there's so many years. different ways you could answer this if you want to answer it fully. But but let me start at a high level and just say that boom and bust cycles are an inevitable part of any capitalist system, right? So boom and bust in energy, boom and bust in tech spending cycles, boom and bust in Bitcoin mining. That's inevitable. But I think where you want to focus for Bitcoin is how Bitcoin is different, right? And so Bitcoin is this global asset. Right, uh, Bitcoin is a scarce asset that's heading towards, uh, you know, absolute scarcity, unlike any other uh, commodity we've ever we've ever seen, right? And so uh, it also adjusts every two weeks based on the difficulty. So it has this this built in mechanism to to kind of self correct. And so yes, there will be periods of of a boom, and in, w- in which case you would want to be more careful as a, particularly as an equity investor, uh, right? But we're so far away. From that, what we have right now is actually the we're at the other side. We're the bust part of the of, of of the process where there there isn't enough capital for all of the profitability that could be extracted in Bitcoin mining right now, right? So even at a thirty thousand dollar Bitcoin price, most of the large scale industrial scale miners, even all in, are are wildly profitable at that level, and they can't even get enough capital to build out all of the operations that they'd like to build out. Uh, and so the, the thing the, the, the thing that um, we focused on is just this disconnect between this digital store value, this this uh, this innovative S curve type of network, what Bitcoin is, where the price can come fundamentally untethered from the energy cost. It just can. We we've seen that historically. The price can go up a hundred, two hundred, three hundred percent in a year. But the ability of the Bitcoin mining uh, industry to keep up with the growth in that network is limited because it's tethered to the real world. It's tethered to can you get enough power from the grid or off-grid, right? And and off-grid mining is really cool, but it doesn't scale 
as easy there as, as on grid mining. So like Crusoe Energy, like clapping for them. They've done a great job in what they're doing, but it's but it's a much harder business than just buying machines and plugging them in to a data center that's uh, uh, you know connected to the grid. And so, you know, you got to acquire power. You got to build. You got to build data centers, right? You've got to uh, acquire these chips, uh, most of which historically have been made in China. I am bullish on Intel and others coming into the space. I think it'd be really good to have a more diversified supply chain uh, for these specialized ASICs. But as of today, there's like three or four providers that that make quality chips in the world. And at various times in a bull market, there's this fundamental supply constraint of even if you have $2 billion, you can't actually buy enough chips or find any data center capacity or even find energy at the same time to meet that meet that demand. So what I think is more likely to happen is that the Bitcoin price routinely is going to run well out in front of what any real world energy infrastructure company could possibly address. Um, because if the price is 100, 200, 300,000 per Bitcoin, you need to spend tens of billions of dollars on energy uh, CapEx, related CapEx, right? So like transformers and buildings and land and uh, ASICs. And you know, there's all these pieces of the supply chain in order to mine Bitcoin at scale. And the process of doing that is much slower than than Bitcoin go up. Bitcoin can go up much faster than anybody can address that market. So I think we're much more likely to be in a in a situation of fundamental undersupply uh, of of Bitcoin mining hash rate relative to the demand um, over the next ten years than we are to be at a position where there's way too much capital or way too many chips chasing uh, you know Bitcoin at at a price that falls uh, too far. Um, so I just think it's asymmetric, and I think. Uh, the amount of real world capex that needs to go into mining is going to lag uh, the price of Bitcoin over the next five or seven years. And yes, there will be a there will be some sort of tippy top boom period where, just like shale, too much money is chasing too much return, too few um, profits. Right at the end of a cycle, but I think that is a long way out, and I don't see any signs of that right now. I'll, yeah. I'll let you know when things are getting frothy, but we're a long way from that. I could actually see the prices of some of these stocks going up between 10 and 100x uh, before there's real froth in this market because they're so undervalued at this point. I love that. Yeah, it's a good answer. Yeah, the, the chips is a big uh, point where it's like you, you, can only, you can only do so much, right? Like you can only create so many of them. We can only get so many ASICs. Talking, shifting more towards like what characteristics of a good mining investment, uh, looking at a company. And again, I'll tie it back to oil and gas because when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But for me, one thing I really, the more I've studied Bitcoin mining, and it's just a fascinating industry because it reminds me so much of commodity extraction business. I mean, the, the parallels are just uncanny. Uh, it's drilling an oil well. It's like you bring it online. It's a bunch of CapEx. Uh, it starts declining, right? When you get it on, in theory, I know the hash price sometimes doesn't decline, but you know, if things are, if people are adding more hash, then it's like the first day you start the mine, in theory, is going to be the day that you produce the most of that commodity. Uh, then it declines out, but there's also some really interesting things that are uh, that are dissimilar. And it's the main one is there's two things. It's one, it's this geographic agnostic element to it, which it ties back to what you said earlier around how powerful it can be on the grid and how powerful it can do all these different things in the energy world. Like this idea that we can move this high demand anywhere we want is amazing. Uh, and if you start to think through the ramifications of that, it's just it it blow your mind, especially for somebody that's spent my career trying to figure out how to build infrastructure to get energy to market. Uh, that was the first thing that struck me. Um, and the second thing that is really amazing about Bitcoin mining that differentiates it from like other resource extraction to some extent is just the way that you can store the commodity and uh, have it forever. And there's no, sh you know, no shelf life and no cost to storing it. And so then you start to think, what's really, what are the most interesting types of mining setups? And to me, I, keep, I come back to oil and gas producers they have a tremendous amount of energy. The energy density in natural gas is just unbelievable. If you look at like a tiny natural gas well that, you know, is barely economic, maybe produces a couple hundred MCF a day and it's dry gas, has no oil, has no liquids or whatever. And then you look at the amount of energy that that would be compared to like a solar farm. And you have to buy like a $20 million solar farm that covers multiple football fields to get a couple megawatts of power. So you've got all this energy and then they've got these other and uh revenue streams and so like right now is actually a really exciting time in bitcoin mining because the hardware is getting cheaper uh there may be capitulation if it gets worse and you've got guys that have all these robust other revenue streams to where if they're mining bitcoin that could just be like a side thing right where they're just holding it and you know it's like when oil went negative 
you, you know, if you didn't have to sell then, think how amazing that would have been. If you had, if you were capitalized when things got really bad, and then by the way, you could hold the product forever until you wanted to sell it. Um, so there's just some characteristics that, uh, that I think are really unique. But when you think about a good Bitcoin mining investment and what, you know, how to screen these companies, um, just any thoughts you had on what I just said, and then also that question for the next one. Yeah. So, I mean, operational execution and efficiency matters, right? And so I, rem I remember I was on Preston Pish's uh, podcast last end of summer and I said, look, like if Marathon actually hits their target and has 130,000 S19 pros plugged in by July of this year, then I'm pretty sure it'll be a decent investment. Um, but the, re the reality is they've had so many issues that they're way behind that forecast. And I said, look, you got to look at what the management team say relative to what they actually are able to accomplish. And so I think there's a bunch of people in this space that are more like hedge funds, yeah. right? Where they're really good at like trading the machines and trading Bitcoin and, and hitting the top of the capital markets, but they don't have any real operational secret sauce, right? They're, they're not particularly, they don't build their own, right? So they're asset light. So they don't build their own data centers. They don't do anything with heat engineering. They don't do anything unique to, to optimize the yield. They don't do, uh, you know, liquid cooled immersion. They don't do uh, any s specific sort of uh, maintenance program to, to keep the machines running longer. I mean, there are people that have S9s that are quite profitable and they're still plugged in. Um, and, and so, you know, modeling how long you can keep these machines running and how valuable they'll be over time somewhat depends on how good you are at, at, at your operating environment. And so I've stopped um, just looking uh, at uh, you know forecast and started actually paying closer attention to right away, is anybody actually achieving what they said they're going to achieve? And the people that are, for the most part, are people that control a, a big chunk of their own stack, right? So they're not people that are outsourcing a big chunk of their operation to someone else. They're people that want to literally own the operation from the ground up. They want to build their own data centers. They want to plug in their own machines. They want to have their own engineers running things, right? They want to uh, control their grid connection. Uh, and so that's the first thing I would look at. I'd say, well, like, what kind of operation is this? Is this a trading firm? Is this a hedge fund? Or is this a serious energy infrastructure operator? Um, and then as you go below the stack there, you want to look at like how good that company is over time at raising equity and debt, right? How good they are at acquiring the machines at the right part of the cycle. Um, you know, people who pay too much for the machines and they lever up uh, too far at the worst part of the cycle, they, they'll end up uh, not being around. And you know, that's why I advise most people who are not going to spend the time to do that. Uh, every dollar you're thinking about putting into Bitcoin mining, you should just buy Bitcoin. Um, because Bitcoin, uh, owning Bitcoin directly removes that operational, uh, execution risk. You don't have to worry whether or not these guys actually bought the machines at the right price or plugged them in or ran them properly, et cetera, and maximize their yield. Or you don't have to worry about that. You can just own the asset, uh, directly. That said, you know, if you're buying a Bitcoin miner and one of the best ones in the world right now, and they're still around in five, seven, 10 years from now, there's a good chance um, that those will be pretty exceptional. Uh, investments on the equity side. And so um, I can't get into too much more detail than that, right? At this point, because uh, a lot of that's just, that's what I do, right? I'm an investor and I spend all my time on this and I'm, I'm not trying to uh, uh, tell people uh, to, to buy specific uh, companies, uh, but I would spend time getting to know the teams, getting to know the operation, understand what the secret sauce is of each one of these firms. Because while they look like they're all the same, there's actually significant differences between them, right? And so the, the Wall Street right now is calling them all Bitcoin miners. But again, some of those firms are really more like trading firms and some of them are more like energy infrastructure operations. Yeah, love that. I don't want to pick on the space a little bit. I mean, I'm going to here a little bit. I don't want to give them too much crap because it is an emerging space. And uh, there's, you know, like any emerging space, you're going to have all types that are trying to get in and, you know, kind of have these gold rush you know, periods, right? Where there's a bunch of people rushing in. But what I've seen and what shocked us in our group was like the level of sophistication uh, it, and differences among some of these groups out there. And you saw groups that were very well capitalized, big name groups, and I won't pick on individuals. And then you saw all the way through the uh, smaller guys, mid-sized guys, and just seemed like a lot of guys were, you know, two years ago, they were like, working on some software at some tech company or like, you know, they were at some finance shop or whatever, but like we didn't see a lot of guys that had just this 
you know, depth of uh, infrastructure experience or energy experience. And that's why when we first got into the space, we're like, this is going to be a space that if the oil and gas people figure it out, they could dominate because this is what they do. They solve like extremely complex uh, energy infrastructure problems. Uh, they build, you know, world class facilities that nobody else in the world does it like U.S. shale. And they have been solving these problems uh, for decades. And you've got all these engineers and all these technical people. And if they could just apply that brain power to Bitcoin mining, they can do amazing things. And we're starting to see it. There's some groups, you know, and like our group, we have a midstream background and I'll brag on our COO. I mean, he's built over a billion dollars worth of infrastructure. And so it's like watching his mind and his gears start to turn, thinking about Bitcoin mining or watching. Uh, we've got a guy that's a petroleum engineer on the team and, you know, he does a lot of the design stuff. And so watching these guys that are these very technical guys start to apply that brain power to Bitcoin mining. It's something that's awesome. And I think that the space will get more sophisticated, um, the, the, you know, the more mature that it gets. But that was just something that struck me was that a lot of the teams just seem kind of experienced light. Uh, they just maybe had good timing or hit the market, right? Is that off the mark or am I just uh, inflating ourselves in, in energy and oil and gas? Just because that's what I know. No, I think that I think that's right. But there's there's different types of experience, right? So, um, you know, I'm thinking of, of one team where the founders, you know, ran infrastructure uh, funds, right? Where they did ports, airports, right? Uh, you know, energy infrastructure, pipelines, et cetera. Um, and then there are other teams where they came more from a tech, uh, a traditional tech background. And I actually had a, an interesting a drinks with, with one of the biggest players in, in North American uh, mining a few weeks ago. And he was saying, look, like we had some engineers that have worked here because, you know, he's been doing this for six, seven years and has one of the biggest teams in the space. He said, look, we, we see these engineers get recycled. So we had some engineers that we eventually figured out had no idea, even though they had great resumes, they had no idea how to work in the data center, uh, right? No, no, how, no idea how to add value um, in that environment. And then we see them pop up at our competitors, right? <laughs> like yeah. a few months later. And so, um, you, you know, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for uh, in terms of value creation in, in the data center environment, then you might hire somebody because they had a great resume and they came from Google. But it turns out they actually, a lot of the stuff they're doing is actually, you know, creating negative value. And the only way you would know that is is by having boots on the ground, actually seeing the results, testing that, uh, quantifying it over time, seeing which data center designs, for example, actually create the highest yields and, and allow for those machines to last as long as possible. And, and so that was just one anecdotal, uh, uh, you know, conversation where somebody pointed out, Hey, there's like five or 10 engineers that are held out as good engineers that we found from actually working with them were quite terrible. Um, I don't know how you would know that, um, unless you'd been in the space five, six, seven years and, and you built these exact type of things. So I think the people that have actually built the the underlying infrastructure right the people who've done it from the ground up and have seen over time what approaches work and which personnel they need in order to deliver certain outcomes i think they have a huge advantage and so yeah there'll be people that come in late cycle um, with a bunch of money but without a lot of actual know-how they'll hire all those engineers um, because those will be the engineers that the best operators won't want uh, and they'll run into a wall and the equity investors will find out you know down the road that they made a mistake but uh, again, that's that's hard to know unless you are, um, you know, doing the scuttlebutt, right? You're you're in the market every day. You're watching how the operators are are behaving. You're looking at their numbers and seeing how operationally efficient they are. And th that just takes time and experience. Yeah, definitely. Well, we saw it early with us. It was like uh, and we were pretty fledgling. We didn't have a, a ton of operations, but for us, it's meaningful. And it was buying the data centers from third parties versus uh, building it yourself. And the first one we did was a third party and, you know, the lead time was longer than we thought it was going to be. It's had issues since we got it. You know, if you think start to think in terms of how much Bitcoin could I mine per day if I just had these machines plugged in, you know, and you start to learn like and you figure it out and it's trial by fire. And so we decided, look, we can cut the lead time, we can cut the cost and we can learn a lot by just building these ourselves. Will they be the best data centers? No, they're going to have issues. But we just decided early on, like, we got to learn this because it's like the more you can learn and the more you can control your destiny in the space, uh, the better off it seems, the less you can have to rely on third parties, whether that be through supply chain or through getting energy or whatever it may be, uh, the better is what we've felt. And so I think that um, that will pay off. Last question on the 
market side, and then I want to shift here at the end to another topic, but just like the more adoption from institutionals, like if you, like if a Bitcoin spot ETF gets approved, uh, does that like, and the more access to like retirement plans that people get with Bitcoin, the more large scale institutions that come in and get people more direct access to it, is that bullish or bearish for mining stocks? I mean, you think like maybe the Michael Saylors of the world wouldn't want these things because he's kind of a proxy right now. Like he's buying Bitcoin. You can't get a spot ETF, but you can buy a micro strategy or you can't, you know, you've got these miners that hold a lot on their balance sheet. So that's another good way to get exposure. Like as the ways that people can get exposure expands, I guess is the question, does that uh, hurt these valuations for the Bitcoin mining? Uh, no, those, th those are short term structural thing. And, and I've actually talked with Michael Saylor about this, right? Like he, he's not betting against uh, adoption because it would hurt, MicroStrategy's share price. He's making a long-term bet on the success of the entire ecosystem. And I think that's the way you want to think about it. Like, if Bitcoin works, like if it really works and it becomes the world's money, it's going to trade at a million bucks or two million bucks, right? And if if Bitcoin's a million bucks, like, how do you value essentially the people, the only people in that ecosystem who can create new Bitcoin every day, right? How do you how do you value them? And I and I think the market just has that wrong in part because uh, the market doesn't understand Bitcoin, right? You have to underwrite Bitcoin to understand it before you would understand a Bitcoin miner. And then even once you do a little bit of work to understand Bitcoin, you look at this pool of 20 or 30 miners and it's hard to know which one's actually gonna be around five or 10 years. Like, because Marathon and Hut and Iris and Core are not really the same company, even though they're all uh, labeled as Bitcoin miners. So th these are all kind of short-term structural constraints. There will be an ETF that's sort of inevitable. Like at some point they'll shut the SEC down Right, if they keep allowing, uh, you know, a, a futures-based ETF with fifteen percent type fees, and they they don't allow the GBTC product to to transition over, right? Like Grayscale is just going to keep hammering at them and the customers. There's a, a lot of customers that hold that product that would like to see it trade at NAV. Um, so, so I think that that happens eventually. And if if the price of Bitcoin goes up, Bitcoin miners will go up too. And so, I, I don't think. Anyone except for short-term traders should be concerned about that. What you really want to be watching is just the long-term adoption metrics of Bitcoin itself. Like, are more people using it? Are more wallets uh, holding Bitcoin? And, and when you look at the data now, it's like there's a huge chunk of the Bitcoin supply that's not moving at all, right? It's just being held uh, by these long-term hodlers, right? Like, there's this, this almost militaristic cult uh, you know, of, of people around the world who who believe in Bitcoin and don't even care what the price is are going to dollar cost average every day, every week, every month. And then you've got an increasing group of institutions, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, et cetera, um, particularly after the Russia-Ukraine crisis where um, they're realizing that before, you know, a currency reserves can just be um, seized at any time. And so, you know, more and more people are looking for what besides gold can be a neutral reserve asset. Um, so to me, it's sort of inevitable, like, yes, in the short term, Bitcoin miners will trade with the NASDAQ, right? And we'll trade with sort of QE versus QT and, and what central banks do. But in the long run, it, it should be pretty closely correlated with the growth in Bitcoin itself. Yeah, it's a great answer. So you said something that I want to key on for the last segment. And you said that to understand Bitcoin mining, you have to understand Bitcoin. This has been the biggest hurdle for me and for our industry by modern streaming oil and gas is that guys just don't get it. You guys think, okay, well, everybody's always asking, what does it trade at in a price per MCF? Like if I, you know, plug this in, how much money could I get for my gas if I were to mine Bitcoin versus uh, selling it to the market? And they're not, they don't understand Bitcoin broadly. And so let alone Bitcoin mining. And then one of the biggest hurdles is just this idea around Bitcoin versus crypto. And you've been tweeting a lot lately about just some of the fiasco on the crypto in the crypto world. But just speak to this, you know, why you're so keyed in on Bitcoin. Some of the uh, just, quite frankly, horrific things that are happening in the crypto space with these uh, Ponzi-like type structures. And just your start with why Bitcoin first for people that are energy guys that maybe need help here. And then go to uh, just like the differentiation between Bitcoin and crypto. And then some of the stuff you're seeing and even some of the recent stuff like with Celsius and these things you've been tweeting about. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, so I, I think the most important thing to understand is um, about Bitcoin versus sort of the broad uh, cryptocurrency market is that most of these cryptocurrencies that were created um, are really just extensions of the existing fiat system, right? They're created by small groups of insiders. They're, they're pre-mined. 
There's VCs that have their take of the pie right off the bat from the beginning. Um, there's sort of like a central insider type committee that has total control uh, over the, the monetary supply. They have control over the treasury. They have control over the rules. They have control over which transactions get confirmed, how consensus is achieved. And so proof of stake is really, you know, just the way the world works today. Like if you have the most money, you win uh, by default. And so the thing to understand about Bitcoin is that it's it's fundamentally different from that. The real innovation of Bitcoin is that proof of work allows for consensus to be achieved without strong arming people. It allows for consensus to be achieved without uh, constant changes in the rules. Um, and it allows you to store your wealth in an asset uh, where you can have a very high degree of certainty beyond any other asset on the planet that your one Bitcoin will still represent fundamentally one Bitcoin uh, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now um, because that monetary policy is dictated by by code. It's dictated by the rules of the protocol itself. Uh, the protocol itself being decentralized enough um, across miners and, and nodes and users such that no single person controls it. And pe people often say, well, how come somebody can't just create another Bitcoin? And the answer actually is path dependency, right? And so the answer is that in order to create another Bitcoin, you'd have to go back in time, rewind to a time when nobody cared about cryptocurrencies, when there was no buzz, there was no hype, right? And actually just create something fair like Bitcoin and allow it to self-propagate over time, organically, without any interference without any influence from outside actors, without any marketing. Bitcoin came to being from scratch and had no market price for the first year because nobody cared, right? Except for a small group of people that uh, expended their own computing power on their laptop in order to, to mine it. And so it just has a very different story. Everything after that was taking advantage of what Bitcoin already created. And, and, but it's, but none of those things are actually like Bitcoin uh, fundamentally. And so Look, Bitcoin won because it happened when nobody was paying attention. It got big enough when nobody was there trying to scam people. Nobody was there trying to, to, to grift. Nobody was there trying to take advantage uh, of hype or the hype cycle. They simply created a fair uh, money based on a protocol and let it uh, grow in the, in the natural market. And so that's hard for people to understand because they want to believe that you could just create a better Bitcoin that has a faster blockchain or does something that is lower energy use or whatever. But the reality is you need to use some energy um, because that's what creates that connection between the real world and this kind of digital world where, where Bitcoin lives in part. Um, and without that linkage, it, it's just another fiat currency that's created out of air that has no basis in reality. You know, Bitcoin has a basis with physics and factual reality because you have to actually have to leverage energy assets in order to keep Bitcoin running over time. And the hash rate has to go up. The amount of energy expended has to go up. Even if the chips get more efficient, there'll be some limit theoretically where the chips can't get any more efficient. Uh, but Bitcoin will continue to use more energy because if people are storing more value on that network, in order to keep that value secure, you need to expend uh, more energy over time to, to protect it. And that's what, what keeps Bitcoin real um, and keeps it anchored to reality in a way that Ethereum and these other protocols won't be. Um, so look, there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of noise. Um, Bitcoin is this wonderful innovation, maybe the only uh, meaningful innovation in this space uh, over time. Like DeFi is interesting because you don't have to go to the bank uh, to ask some centralized entity for a loan. Um, but it seems to be more likely that you're going to get uh, scammed or abused in DeFi right through some sort of exploit or hack. Um, then, then you would get your money stolen or, or uh, hurt in the traditional system, and so yeah, they're 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 kind of whiz bang and sexy. You know, look, I got a loan and I'm uh, yield farming and earning twenty percent or whatever. But then you get wiped out, and so a lot of people who thought they were really smart were earning twenty percent on the anchor protocol, and then the whole thing collapsed. And so you know, if you're earning twenty percent yield but you lose your entire principal, your your net return is negative. Um, and I think a lot of, like, if you encapsulate all of DeFi uh, and you look at the returns that are actually generated, I think they're actually going to be negative for everybody except for the savvy people who managed to uh, buy some of these tokens really early on, like like Pantera, right, made something like 175 times their money. 
uh, on on uh, Terra Luna and extracted all of that profit and left anybody who stayed in that protocol with a huge loss after they after you know the thing collapsed. And so Bitcoin creates value in this beautiful flywheel across the ecosystem for everybody. Who if you if you participate in Bitcoin and you stay for three to five years historically. Uh, all you have to do is hold Bitcoin in cold storage and, and you accrue value. DeFi, on the other hand, has routinely wrecked large uh, percentages of the people who participate in it. Um, and so it's not, it, I just don't view it as the same thing. I view uh, Bitcoin as this sound, beautiful sound money, this pristine collateral, right, that has a tie to the real world through energy. And then I see DeFi and these other things as these uh, really um, extended whiz bang innovative looking on the surface uh, innovations that ultimately lead to loss uh, for most people that participate in them. That's a great explanation. No, I think that's important because it's just one of the things that I'm challenged with as I try to educate people in traditional energy about Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. And you just see, they see these things like the Terra Luna collapse and it's just like, it's a black eye because they're like, this is all just a scam. See, this is the same thing that happened here is going to happen with Bitcoin. And then you're just trying to explain to them, this is a totally different thing. It, it is more akin to traditional finance and trying to get around some of the rules. And And I don't know, I'm not saying that no innovation will come from DeFi or crypto. I just think that I struggle to see the differences today versus just this traditional finance stuff. They're just skirting the rules and being more aggressive than you could be. And obviously and then exposing people to more risk. And Bitcoin's tied back to energy and it's tied back to this proof of work. I think you did a great job explaining it earlier around uh, just these different mining companies and the struggles that they face. Proof of work isn't just like the energy usage. It's everything involved. It's the planning. It's the thousands of man hours that go into putting these mines in. It's the operations. It's the continual maintenance. It's all this stuff. It's like, you know, if, if anybody that understands the law of compounded growth and how you know, you put money in your 401k when you're in your 20s and then that money over time because of compound growth has so much power to grow. You then understand when you think about proof of stake, you say, well, wait a second, like, aren't the guys that have the most money right now that just stake the coins? Like, isn't that, aren't they just, isn't it just going to snowball over time to where it'll be just those people that basically own it because of the rule of compounding growth? And if you bring that up to proof of stake, people they are just like, uh, and it's like, think about it. I mean, like, it's not the same proof of work and proof of stake are just totally different things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's just a point that I think is important and I've covered all the stuff I have. If you have anything left, uh, after that, if you want to add one final thing here, but, uh, I'll respect your time on Memorial day and let you go. I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, no, this is, this has been great. I look forward to, uh, seeing you at some Bitcoin mining, uh, events through the rest of the rest of the year. I think you were at the Texas uh, the one in Austin back in, I think it was February. Yeah. Yeah. That was I think you were one. there. I didn't get to chat with you there, but I'll be at some of the other events later this year. I go to some of the, uh, Bitcoin mining events on behalf of Iris energy. I'm, I'm on the board. I'm an independent director, but because we have such a small presence in North America to date, cause this is an Australian based, uh, miner, sometimes they'll send me right as a, as a representative, which works for both of us. Cause I get to go to a, a uh, cool conference and continue to meet, uh, you know, meet, meet up with people from the space and learn. Uh, but they also get to have a representative in North America. They don't have to fly out from Australia. Yeah. So hopefully I'll see you at some more uh, mining conferences later this year. Absolutely. We'll do it. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you taking time on Memorial Day. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye.